the idea of being separate in the world is so absurd. Yes. When, uh, yes. when we compare it to being together in the world. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, that particular young woman, she was uh, quite. She, you know, there was something in her writing that I thought showed promise, so I, I encouraged her. I mean, uh, of course, I, I, I'm afraid I'm not absolutely democratic. I don't say, well, it doesn't matter, you know. But because I thought she had the quality, you know, she re there was a really interesting quality. She had interesting ideas, which I thought were really worth, worth um, you know, making. Uh, it needed a lot of work. It did need a lot of editing work to to shape it and to make it readable and that's what I, I find as an editor is important to make it to, to make it into something readable uh, that that is therefore accessible to the wider anglophone world and then the wider anglophone world is kind of what I have access to rather than you know I can't really go beyond that mm. without being translated which well, this strikes me as a good place to start. Mm. Uh, so tell me about um, how you encountered this, this woman and, and how that um, conversation you had with her. Yes. Because that was a very a, a lovely message to receive. Mm. So yes. can you flesh that out? Um, well, as editor of Transnational Literature, um, which is, was an international open access journal, um, I receive, you know, contributions from people all over the world, and uh, and I received a, 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 an essay from. Uh, now I, I can't quite remember whether ha, what she first gave me, whether it was a book review or or, a, or an essay, but it was an, an essay on comparative literature, which I thought had something very interesting to say about. Oriental influences in 18th century English literature. Um, and so uh, I worked with her to, um, to make a, to, to shape the essay into a, um, you know, in, into a really good contribution to that, to that subject, and we published it. Um, and uh, then since then she's, She's done more work. Uh, she, she wrote book reviews, you know. So I would send her some books, books to review that I thought she would be interested in reviewing. And uh, and she's also just contributed a chapter to our book on Tagore as well. So uh, so I've always found her, you know, you know her work worthwhile. So um, but. We haven't ever met, even though she's come to Australia. And we haven't actually managed because it's a long Queensland is a long way from South Australia, so we haven't ever quite managed to to meet. But I, I hope one day we will we will meet. <laughs> this is always a pleasure, actually encountering the person with whom you've had so much um, correspondence. Do you, do you find that with uh, what you're doing? Does it connect you with the whole world? Yeah. Well. Pretty much. Um, I mean, not the whole world, I suppose. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I think, you know, I, I come on a trip like this, or in fact, indeed, I was last year. I, I went on a trip. I went to both India. I went into India in the first part of the year, and then later I went to Japan and Malaysia and Mauritius and Sri Lanka, and all those. And I people to connect with everywhere there and then this trip I'm going to go all around the UK with a lot of people I keep you know wanting to hook up with um, Italy Spain and the Czech Republic so and then there's someone in Denmark who says oh why don't you pop up to Denmark and see me you know so um, <laughs> it's just a nice idea but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, so Yes, I mean, with you edited a, a, an international journal like that for ten years, you make hundreds and hundreds of connections. I, I, there were probably some statistics 
in something I sent you about how many contributors we've had from how many countries. And, and each one of those, in a way, you know, you work with those people, to, 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 especially when they're authors of substantial articles. You, you know, the, the editing process is quite a two-way thing and you, and you do work with them. Um, and, you know, you do make these, make these links um, and, and some, you know, quite often they do become, in, you know, really interpersonal uh, uh, links and friendships. Um, and sometimes you actually meet these people, <laughs> which is lovely. Oh, and the US as well, of course. I, you know, there are a lot of people in the US. Well, that is uh, that, that humanizes mm. publishing mm. greatly for mm. me because for, I, I suppose for a lot of people mm. we, we see the the, the publication yes. but we don't witness the relationship. Yes, yeah, yeah, yep. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that that editor writer relationship mm. And, mm. and what's what's going on there. Yeah, uh, well, as I see it. Um, I mean, the first thing, you, you are a gate, gatekeeper. You are uh, making decisions about what's, you know, there are various stages of the process where you make decisions. So um, we, you know, we, so we assess what we get first. And you know, if it passes muster at the first, at first, you know, I hear about a lot of the the, the big journals who they say if, if your referencing isn't correct in your first, just you know, we will reject it straight away. Well, I've never been like that. It's it's if there are worthwhile idea, ideas, interesting arguments. It's an interesting topic that we, you know, that and it suits our journal. We will go ahead. We will go further with it. We'll take it further, and then if it's a, an academic article, then it has to go through a, a an anonymous peer reviewing process, so that um, so that two independent people get to look at it and make their comments, um, which they then feed, which then come back to me, and then I kind of I will then curate or curate. I don't know. That's not the right word. Um, I will. Uh, collate, I suppose, you know, and I'll say these are the reports and, you know, I, and I would never say you have you must do everything that, the, that these people have told you to do because sometimes there's, a, there's clearly a misunderstanding or a, or a misjudgment or something. But, um, but I... But the author is still the author's piece. It's still that they're still coming out under their name. So I wouldn't make them change something that that um, I wouldn't make them try and say something that they don't want to say. It's how they say it. It's, it's making it readable. It's making it accessible to the to the to the broader readership, so that. You know, so that they can express their ideas and their arguments out. You know, on a on a platform, on an international platform. Yeah. Um, be part of the big, you know, the huge scholarly <laughs> um, discussion that goes on around the world these days, and um, you know, and and be be taken seriously by the rest of them, you know, by their peers. So. That's what I'm. That's what I'm. Think I'm trying to do. It's just facilitation, rather than a. You know, I never try and impose <laughs> ideas or whatever. In fact, you know, sometimes I disagree with something I publish, but that doesn't mean if if it's been put forward properly and it's argued well, that's fine. You know. I don't think I ever understood that mm. prior to submitting. Articles to journals mm -hmm. yeah. and, and peer review processes. Mm. I always thought it uh, as uh, as a a process of gatekeeping mm. rather than uh, dialogue and nurture. Mm. 
and I've been very pleasantly surprised by, yeah. by this. Oh, oh good. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, right, you're phrasing it this way. Yeah. Our, our readers might not understand that. Exactly. Can you yes. uh, add clarity to Yeah, this? exactly, yeah. Mm. And, and it puts, puts me at ease as, as somebody outside of academia. Yeah. Mm. Uh, w- when I've created something, there's been a dialogue around it, mm. and it's been recognised as something interesting to, to include in, yes. a, in a wider dialogue. Yes. yes. Um, do, do you see... Well, how, how do you see uh, what, what you publish being a part of uh, um, cultural life? Um, it's, yeah, of course, you know, the next question is what, what do you mean by cultural life? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, the, if there is such a thing as, as cultural life in a sort of monolithic way, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's such a big, a big thing, but, um, I suppose you know the the thing about particularly about transnational literature is that has a has a really uh, broad remit. So it, it it transnational literature. So you know we get all sorts of submissions, and sometimes we think, well, this is neither anything to do with transnationalism or literature. So probably we'll say no to this, <laughs> but. If it had some literary um, content, you know, it's about literature in some in some form or other, and it has some element of transnationalism, and that can be, that could be um, uh, a post-colonial, from a post-colonial country, from a country where English is not the the first language. Um, from um, doesn't have to have an an, an explicit transnational sort of doesn't have to reference transnational themes in its in particular, but it just has to be. And also, I I was always interested in new readings of of, of classic literature, or, you know, um, sort of. The, the canon or, you know, earlier literature. So so uh, a, an article on 18th century literature from the point of view of a Bangladeshi author, for example, or, um, or a, um, a, 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 re, a rethinking of Jane Austen from a, from a contemporary American perspective or, or whatever. You know, one of my favourite articles that I published was about the Cinderella story coming f- Ooh, coming yeah. through from China's China foot, Chinese foot binding coming through along the Silk Road this story and ending up in Hans Christian Andersen or was it Grimm oh. as a as a as a fairy fairy story in the, in the European canon and this this author had done that had traced that story, you know, back to and and seen how it sort of developed. So, I mean, th- these sort of things, I think, are just are just so illuminating and make you think again about European culture and, and where where it's where it comes from. Yes, I've, I've always uh, well, I, I I haven't always appreciated. Um, uh, the English language, mm. but when I discovered uh, the the it's it's a Mongol language, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's it's as mutable as a cloud, mm. uh, and mm. the the ideas of living language mm. and mm. knowledge living in people, yes, I started to relate to yes English as a we a way of seeing. Interculturally, yes, uh, or, yes. or seeing yes. what I'm not seeing. Yes, I guess. yes, yes. That's so good. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. In terms of transnationalism, mm. what themes 
are, are, are prominent in that? Um, well, I suppose that, you know, the, the, the classic one is migration, um, diaspora, um, or, you know, being, being, uh, or displacement or, you know, the, the sort of move, moving around or, or, or just, um, just the way the world is now, really, isn't it? I mean, it's just there's very few places that that are not. Um, I was kind of I kind of inherited the word transnational. I might not have used national in that way um, myself if I was thinking of it, but I might have thought perhaps transcultural or something like that, in, rather than you know that rather. Ancient term national, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I did I did sort of inherit that from the previous um, t- subtitle of the journal, which was the Australian Journal of Transnational Literature or something like that. So I, for continuity, I kept that. Um, yeah. So, um, but uh, but as I say, you know, I I made sure that it could be interpreted <laughs> as broadly as possible and I, I, I tried to encourage my my fellow editors to to see it that way as well to, um, yeah. um, from from the the brief look into uh, the, the range of work mm. that done, um, I, it would be nice to hear you tell me more about where you've come from and what what interests have inspired you along these routes? Okay, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, for me, it's quite a quite almost accidental, really, because as as so many things are, mm-hmm. um, because I was um, I, I've always in my in my own personal research, I'm, I'm much more of a person who likes to stick to one author, you know, to look closely at one author. I'm a, a, my, I, I don't partic- I don't have a lot of personal interest in reading literature politically. I'm not saying that, you know, it's not valid, but it's, it's my way of reading literature is to read closely and, and read, you know, really pay attention to the text and, and excavate things from the text rather than to... Go go broader and look at the historical. I mean, I I think both is good, but um, so I tended to have a few authors that I was interested in and I would write about. Um, and but it's to, partly to do with my university when I when I uh, I was at Flinders University in South Australia for. Uh, 27 years or something. Um, at, in the 1970s, um, our English, some of our English department, our English staff, set up a centre for research in the new literatures in English. And they were very active in the you know, early days of the, the, that, that, that field. So... Um, they were there was some one person in particular, um, Dr. Sid Harricks, who who um, who was a very who was a, a, a net you know what we would nowadays call a networker. You know he was wonderful at bringing people together, and, and he would you know travel to India and it was and um, the Caribbean in particular. And he had a lot of contacts there, and uh, he he. They, they had a journal and transnational literature was a sort of descendant of that journal um, various through, through a couple of other iterations um, and he, and of course when I did English at Flinders I, I came back to study after 20 years I, I started work at Flinders as a librarian so I was I was working in the library but I'd always really wanted to do more further study. And um, I got, uh, I just, well, I'll just do, do honours English and, and then I just did a PhD and that's so that sort of, 
and uh, the pe- the the this particular person, Sid Harris, who t- took the the um, the uh, what is it, post-colonial literature, I suppose it would be called it, post-colonial literature in Caribbean, post-colonial literature Indian. He took the honours courses on that, and uh, you know I took a lot of other courses too. I took courses on Shakespeare and Jane Austen and various other things, but Sid was the one who said, that's a good essay, you should publish that. And he and he said, you should send that to this journal. I will give you an introduction to the editor. <laughs> and it was published and that switched something on because you, I never thought of my honours essays as being, you know, worth publication and that just started me off I started thinking well okay so that works all right I'll try again and so I kept that just started me off on the the publication um and and because it because he was a post-colonialist well in that in that you know if you want a better term it's a contested term obviously but there's commonwealth literature or there's post-colonial literature there's new literatures in English world literature. So there's all these different different terms that, that I used. Um, but um, I it was often in the, that sort of, those sort of areas that I that I that I was more active because there was that encouragement and I'd started publishing there so that kind of snowballs. And also in Australia, there are much, many more conferences on that sort of approach, the post-colonial approach, rather than the, the sort of single author conferences you get here. So, I mean, here I'm in 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 the Europe. I'm actually quite well known as an, an Iris Murdoch scholar, um, which is almost you know there are. There is overlap, but, you know, it's almost a completely different world. Um, but in, in Australia, there's not, there's not the, the focused academic interest in Iris Murdoch that there is in, in, in Europe. So um, there, those sort of conferences weren't available to me in Australia. So I, I ended up tending to go to these post-colonial conferences, present on well, VS Naipaul and... and um, Jane Curtsy and various, you know, Doris Lessing, post-colonial authors or colonial authors. So that's just, and then, then because we had this journal and they needed an editor and I kind of piped up at the, at either the right moment or the wrong moment, depending what you, <laughs> and kind of found myself, <laughs> found myself sort of falling into the editorship of it. Um, and once I'd taken it on, well, it's, it was a huge amount of work over 10 years. Um, and, yeah. and, of course, I'd, after, after a while I brought together a team of, of assistants. But it was, um, it was very, very worthwhile, as I was saying. You know, now I've got this wonderful sort of network of contacts all around the world that, that, uh, that uh, just builds and builds. So, yeah. I'm very interested to hear about when, when that moment when you first published. Oh, and yeah. mm. uh, what is it about publishing, about mm. putting your thoughts on paper yeah. and that going into the world yeah. and the rest of the world being able to pick it yeah. up? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, it, well, it's, uh, it's, it can be quite frightening. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, I mean, academic publishing is really, it's, 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 it's really, um, you know, you don't usually get a lot of hate mail, for example, <laughs> or, or fan mail, <laughs> a little bit sometimes, but, um, you know, you, it's, it's not as, perhaps as brave as some some kind of publishing, but it's still you are putting yourself out there and you are put, laying yourself out there for judgment. 
um, probably the most um, uh, controversial thing I've ever published was uh, an essay on, um, or a short piece really, on Matthew Flinders. So Matthew Flinders is the, um, it was a British explorer who was the first, the captain of the first ship to circumnavigate Australia, explored quite a lot of the, the coastline, especially of South Australia where I live. Um, and I've done a lot of work on him, uh, mainly his life rather than his, his, his uh, and his writings rather than his sort of exploring activities. But um, I, I wrote an article on him and his his dealings with the Australian Aborigines, um, and I, you know I wrote it. It's a it's a long article, and it's just about to come out in a in a book about encounters between Aborigines and and, and first ex, uh, explorers who first first encounters, you know, early encounters, uh, which is fascinating. You know. One, two completely alien cultures encountering each other. What happens? How how do they how do they how do they see each other? How do they how do they cope? How, what happens? And and all sorts of different things happened. You know, from violence to friendly friendship to you know so-called friendship. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, I wrote it. I I wrote it. I did an edited version, a short version for the conversation. Do you know about the conversation? It's the, really the bell, yeah. There's a it's it's an academic sort of journalism. So it's a free uh, daily sort of news news bulletin, I suppose. Um, I think it might have started in Australia, but I think it, it's um, it's over. You know, it's, it's also here now. So, you know, this comes into people's inboxes and, and there are, you know, maybe a dozen articles on, on all, sort, you know, all sorts of different, um, as, you know, there's arts and culture, there's, social, there's economics, there's whatever, science, you know. So there's, you know, it's, it's, so it's writing for a popular, for, for the general public from yeah. academia. So it's, it's actually, you know... <laughs> <laughs> good, good for the ragged university. It's um, and um, and so I did this version of this article, which which is not uncritical of Flinders, but it's not exactly damning him. It's saying, well, you know, I wonder why he why he, why did he think that it was all right to you know when it, when someone was when the Aborigine up in Northern Territory was was killed by his men and he was very he was you know he was really upset by that and everything but then he just took the body away he didn't he didn't give it back to them for burial and that just seems to me to be I said well how could he not realize how offensive and how awful that was to take the body away and not to not you know because in you know in in your own culture the remains of a of a dead, you know, if you, if you say a, a soldier died of sunstroke and they gave him, they, they buried him at sea with the normal rites. But this man was denied that and they, they took away the body to, to study scientifically or whatever. Uh, so it's just, I was just questioning those sort of, those sort of interactions and, and, you know, thinking, well, you know, why, why did, why did he do this and not that? And why did he take? Um, and I thought, I thought, you know, I thought if I'm going to be attacked, it was probably going to be by the people saying you're being too soft on Flinders. You should be, you know. But it was the other way around. I was getting, I got, I got so many really virulent comments about, oh, so Flinders was evil, was he? No, I didn't say Flinders was evil. I said he's, he was human. <laughs> He was, you know, and perhaps he didn't always make the, the right, the best decision, but I never said he was evil. You know? But, the, the, you know, it was just, it was, it was, 
I, I, I really, cause, because you, the thing about the conversation is that it is a conversation in a way yeah. because people can comment and then other people can argue. And so there was this sort of huge long argument going on after my piece. And I was like, oh, you know. <laughs> um, so that was, that was a, um, so I, the only other thing, I, I did a, a piece on Jane Austen as well for the conversation. Um, which went much better. <laughs> I didn't seem to ha- raise any <laughs> any heckles there. So, <laughs> um, so it, it was a yes, yeah, quite a different um, quite a different reaction to that. But but yes, I know other people who who tried you know written feminist articles or whatever. It just they just get shouted at, you know. And uh, so it is. It can be really frightening, especially if you get out there into the into the wider world beyond academia. Um, it, it's it can be quite intimidating. Do, do, what do you find? Do you find that? I think yeah. It, it it's interesting in eight years of doing public events mm. and inviting uh, anybody can do a talk. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, only twice has there been significant uh, reaction. Mm. Uh, w- once uh, it was ar- around so- somebody that was wanting to talk about uh, the 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 issues they felt were with. Would you like a coffee? Oh, a cup of tea would be nice. Thank you, Neil. A black coffee would be kind. Thank you. Um, they wanted to talk about the issues mm. around uh, vaccines mm. and and mm-hmm. that that was closed down. Mm. Um, mm. People in the public said yeah. no, nobody should be able to even speak about these issues. And and I had to spend time trying to communicate, well, what kind of a world do we create yeah. where people are not allowed to even examine and discuss yeah. public yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's the things that they have to examine mm. in their own minds? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that was one moment. And, and mm. another was on social media. Uh, mm. there, were, there were a number of academics who felt very upset that I had allowed somebody to publish who had a criminal, a, a previous, a spent cr- criminal uh, conviction. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So they were saying, no, these people should not be engaged with, should not be allowed to speak, should not uh, be allowed to publish. Yeah. You should, you are mm-hmm. under, I, 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 Again, I had to go back and I said, well, what kind of world yeah, do yeah. we set up when yeah. somebody has been convicted by the courts? Mm. It is forever a criminal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, even after the law stipulates, yes, they have they've spent... spent they've, they've served their term, yes. And it frightened yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. I had a similar thing, actually, in, um, as a librarian. Um, there was somebody who was who's who was a PhD graduate of our of our university, and I was the custodian of the of the thesis collection. So you know, and somebody this one of our PhD graduates was convicted of a um, of sort of child pornography or something, you know, um, viewing child pornography, something like that. And, and he was, and they withdrew his thesis from the collection. I thought, you can't do that. That's changing history. Um, then, you know, then there was a the book he'd written was withdrawn from the library collection and taken off all the reading lists. And, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's 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 tricky. It's a difficult. I know it's a difficult question, but but uh, you know, I, I I what worried me was the 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 immediate acquiescence of my 
superiors in the library to to this, you know, because I thought, well, you know, we should uh, discuss this and, and say and, and make our, as librarians, we, we have a kind of, you know, our professional charter, as it were, is to, is, is accessible, accessibility to knowledge and um, to just say, oh, yes, okay, well, you know, for the purposes of looking good, looking as though we're doing the right thing, we'll, we'll just withdraw it. I, I identify oh, the, 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 the foundational line with the activities I do in mm. public context is mm. that this fits within the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Mm. Mm. So it gives a, a, a sort of broad mm. yeah. yeah. Um And I, I had to think and understand what what role I was playing. Yeah. And yeah. I think well, where, where I got to was understanding education mm. as a pre-political mm -hmm. pro process. Mm. This is not about mm. people coming up and proselytizing. Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is mm. what yeah. we're trying to do is examine things. Yeah, teach critical thinking. Hugh reflections, yeah. mm. you know, mm. and, and, and not, not uh, overrule perspectives in yeah. culture, yeah. but create a space where, okay, can we talk about this? Yes. yes. The, the, a law has yeah. not been broken. Yes. And not everybody agrees with this, yeah. you know, on mm. these issues. And if I bring in my perspectives and make everything about what yeah. I think, <laughs> yeah. we're getting into yeah. the same filter bubbles yes. As, yes. as Facebook yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I noticed mm. in, in your, uh, your presentation on the work you've done in libraries mm. that you public talks and public mm. uh, uh, activities mm. that were controversial was was a a feature that, yeah. that you the, it was a place for yeah examining yeah. these things yeah. Um, yeah. How, how did you find that that went in there usually it it went pretty well i mean sometimes um some of the audience members were resistant i, I remember there was a there was a writer who wonderful South Australian writer who's, who's, um, who wrote, oh, she's, she's fantastic, but she's, well, the particular book that she'd just written was about um, a refugee, and this was before we had the, in, the, the extra inhumane policy of sending refugees to, to, to desolate islands in the Pacific which I don't know if you know about that. But it's, it's no, I didn't. The, there are these basically island concentration camps where we just send refugees. If they arrive by boat because that's, that's you know, it's, it's not illegal to claim asylum but if you arrive by boat. But the, the, the justification is that if they arrive by boat, um, then they've been... Are dealing with these wicked people smugglers who, who are just making money out of them and who and who don't care about their welfare and that therefore we to in order to uh, break the business model of the pe people smugglers we have to punish these people who've who've given all their life savings and, and gone gone on a leaky boat so we we punish the people who who were their clients by saying they will never be able to settle in Australia and they're sent off to an offshore island where we have where we pay millions and millions of dollars to the government of the, this island to 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 house them and it, it's just deeply deeply ah oh, it's just disgusting anyway sorry yes. <laughs> kind of yeah. kind of beside yeah. the point but this is even before that when we when we were sending them to inhospitable detention camps 
in the interior of Australia where, you know, the, the extremes of weather and, and you know, this. Away from was, the, the plush. Yeah, so, so that, you know, so people, they were sort of supposed to be out of sight, out of mind, I imagine. But, um, but Eva wrote this wonderful novel about it, about one of these boys and, you know, tracing him all the way from Syria through his journey and how he ended up in this place in Woomera and then he went to New Zealand and claimed asylum from Australia. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I thought it was such a powerful book. Anyway, she came and talked and she and she and her talk was on, you know, speaking truth, you know, speaking truth to power basically. And um, one, one reaction was, I thought, you know, she she was speaking to a captive audience, and obviously this woman was was not didn't agree, and was because it was very passionate. Uh, most people, you know, I think, were you know were, were were really glad to be there and read, but this particular woman was was cross, and I mean I don't know why she thought she was a captive audience because she could have got up and walked out at any time. <laughs> we didn't lock the doors. <laughs> um, so, but, um, but yes, I mean, mainly, well, well usually the, the speakers were, you know, academics or writers, and the idea was to air, you know, that the, the aim was to air ideas and present their research and, and so, and then be able to be part of a discussion with the, with the that was always a very important part of it. And it's, they were, it would never, it was a smallish room, I suppose, that would seat. When we had J- Jane Curtsy talking, um, I think we stopped counting at 110 people. You know, <laughs> just, uh, and that was pretty crammed. Um, but usually we would get 50 people or something like that. Enough so that, you know, small enough so that there could be a, a discussion, we could take questions for. 20 minutes or so after the talk and then after that there would be um you know wine and cheese mm-hmm. and you know and and then the conversation the speaker usually would stay and and, and the conversation would continue mm-hmm. um or else you know in other times we would have a um we would have a, a a panel. So on stem cells, for example, we had a scientist and a and a lawyer and a and a, a theologian, um, and maybe one other person. We had one on food, which was about uh, which where we had a, a a nutritionist and a, a psychologist and a co- and a sort of um, food writer. Um, that was really fun, oh, yeah. you know. So, um, you know, what what about attitudes to food and, and, and food and culture? Um, so, yeah, I think that that, that you that I was always my aim to try and get a variety and also across the across the the the, 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 the year. I was, you know, I look at the, the sort of program as developing as it was developing. Think, oh, hang on, we've got. Because you'd always get lots of humanities people and historians and, and people with, you know, who who who'd written books. But I'd always have to say, hang on, we've got to get some scientists and and some <laughs> sort of uh, you know health scientists. And um, uh, so so I tried to make it a right, varied program across across each year as well, and you know, gender balance and all those things, you know, that you, <laughs> you try and make sure that you. Yeah, you're, you're keeping it, keeping to, yes. In in your notes, I I um, saw that you you're, you're speaking of the library as an interface mm-hmm. between mm-hmm. the academy and yeah, the, the yeah, community. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, can you talk a little about that? What's well, I I always, you I think that's what libraries really are. I mean, it's. That's the basic premise of a library is, is to is to be an informa- provider of knowledge and information and 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 you know the world's that that's how we started and and I think you know given 
Uh, however, it goes on. The, the technologies change, but the ideas are so, the same as far as I can see. Um, so it was really quite disappointing when it was decided not to continue that. And because and we're a publicly funded university, um, you know, I I saw it as part of a university's, not just the library, but the university's um, mission. You know, role in society to. You know, what's the point of just just talking to each other? You know, we need to take the ideas out there, and and if, and and it's, and it's, of course it's valuable for both sides too. And if if you're hearing, if you're only hearing, uh, if you don't ever hear the voices from from the people who. Uh, and of course, they're self-selecting audiences. So it's, it's not just <laughs> not just random, but that but they are people who who have a very you know wide variety of of life experience and and social background and that sort of thing who, who used to come along. You know, some of the people you'd think you know. I wonder. Some 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 of my staff used to occasionally say, "Oh, they're just coming for the cheese." <laughs> These people couldn't afford cheese like that. <laughs> But I don't think that was it. I, it was, um, okay, there were a few people who came every time, every single time, whatever was the subject. But but um, if you didn't have, you know, the, it was, I think it was really the subject and, and they were a really engaged audience. Um, yeah. It's, it's good to hear that, that public value of institutions mm, mm. being spoken about. I'm not sure how uh, similar it is to the UK, but... Sorry. Were you drawing us there, or do you want to have your coffee? Uh, well, maybe we could continue talking if, yeah. if yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll bring it here. Oh, well, if you don't mind. Well, Thank okay. you. Thanks, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the universities mm. here mm. Are, are all charities in the legal uh -huh. yeah. base. Mm. And it stems back to the starting of the, uh, the universities. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Where the, the university was actually a charitable guild. Ah, uh, yes. So Bologna University uh -huh. uh, first formulated itself as a, uh, as a charitable guild of learners, of students. And to this day, we find the universities exist. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, exists as charities. Mm. So... Follows from that, in my mind, to ask the question: What is this? What What is charitable about this institution? Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that's interesting. So I, I wasn't aware of that. Um, Well, yeah. So, in in what sense of charity? I mean, because of charity is ah. <laughs> caritas. <laughs> um, who is the beneficiary of this charity? Mm. Is it society in general, or is it the the, the students, or is it? I, I think it's, uh, my own interpretation mm -hmm. is it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. And as public institutions, mm -hmm. there the, the, a lot is about reinvesting in the world. Mm -hmm. It's um, reinvigorating the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the commons, if you like, yeah. which makes sure that future generations uh, yeah. have... Yeah. Have wealth, it forms of wealth. Yes, 
Yes, <laughs> yes, and, and I know you're not talking about monetary wealth there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. Uh, and yeah, I mean, without universities, where would we be? You know, uh, um, just you know, the, and uh, but it's such. In a way, it's a difficult because it's so intangible, it's a difficult argument to, to run it, with people who, who don't, whose lives are not, don't, they don't feel as though they're directly affected. Um, yes, I, mm. I found that on the, the journey of Ragged University, mm. trying to talk about specifically informal learning. Yes, yeah. Mm. Uh, it's not got the same purchase mm. as uh, well, originally the, the charity regulator said, okay, yeah. well, if you're going to be an educational charity, mm. you have to administrate exams. Yes. You have to show outcomes for <laughs> everybody who's in the room. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and we realised that into the, in the, into the rooms, people were coming from all different backgrounds and all different levels. Mm. And that as soon as bringing bureaucracies in to mediate those personal mm. spaces, mm. The, the, the behaviours that mm. allowed personal mm. connections mm. fostered those, those uh, unique moments in life where yeah. you walk away and go... That was really interesting. I will go and read about this. Yes. I will, you know, it, it sets you on a trajectory. Mm. Those were, um, the, the, those those relations were damaged. They were changed. Mm. The, mm. the the nature of them changed. Yes. And learning in an institution where there is resources and there's structure mm. and there's support yes all of those mm, mm. it's a different context yes and I've, yes. I've come to argue that the formal needs the informal yes and yes. the informal needs the formal i agree yeah, <laughs> i do I so agree with that yes um no i think you know it's, it's a it can be so enriching either way you know the, the the, the the sort of things I do, you know, I do a lot of talking in public. <laughs> well, in in you know, present presenting. So, you know, I, I I gave a couple of papers last week in um, in Scotland. So, the one in um, that I gave at St Andrews was about Jane Austen and music and. and um, and it was a small audience, there were maybe eight or ten people, but they were so engaged and the, the discussion was so good and they were all, you know, we were all on the same page, as it were, you know, everyone sort of knew what I, I was talking about. So there was no, there was no sort of, um, I didn't have to uh, sort of talk down. I'm not that I hate, I hate talking down, but, you know, I, I could speak in, in the normal academic register that I that I, that I would speak in, um, and that was you know, and I got so much from that. Um, but also, you know, I also would speak at our local Jane Austen Society, for example, and, and I'm, re I'm really quite proud that I took the idea. Of, I'm not sure if you how much you sort of know about the sort of technicalities of, of narrative. But there's a thing called free and direct discourse. Do you know anything about that? It's, I couldn't talk. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's really, it's when a character is, uh, when a narrator, a third-person narrator is, it still seen, reads grammatically as if the, the third-person narrator is still just speaking, is just writing. It's not. It's not in, in inverted commas. Nobody's speaking. It's not even. Doesn't even say she thought. But it's just 
suddenly you're inside the character's head oh. and your your their thoughts are coming out there. You know, so their thoughts are almost transcribed. So Jane Austen kind of invented that. Right. Oh. You know, she, she, she used it extensively in her later novels. And, um, and so this was something, this makes you read, not read literature differently when you know about this because um, I think, you know, even it, 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 the most intelligent reader without knowing just that little, that little trick would think that the novelist is just writing what the novelist believes. And so in uh, Jane Austen's Emma, for example, you know, Emma is full of snobberies and, and, and um, outrageous thing, uh, opinions that then get proved wrong and that sort of thing. And if you think that that's actually just Jane Austen believing all these things and saying all these things and, and, and then it's a, it's a really quite an impoverished reading of the, of the novel. Um, but so I gave a talk at the local Jane Austen Society about explaining how this works and showing examples and things. Let's see, you know, what's happening in this paragraph. You see, it starts off with the narrator being just the narrator and then all of a sudden she's in Emma's head. And then she comes out of Emma's head again, you know. And um, and a, a year later, I went back, and they were reading. They were reading through Emma themselves, and they and they were doing this, mm. and they'd picked it up, and and they'd stopped saying, "Oh, I hate Emma." She's, a, <laughs> you know, she's that, and uh, you know, it's it, 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 it just brought the, that subtlety to the, to the reading, and I, and I was so I was really really proud of myself. I must admit. <laughs> um, because I think you know it's it's worth it's worth you know letting people know these these things. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's is it through these dialogues that my uh, for, from a world that was very impoverished mm. has become very wealthy. Mm. You know, I, yes. I've, yeah. I enjoy the world so much more mm. since I learned the. To dialogue in in terms of that oh I'm learning mm. and every, everybody has a, a world to share yes yeah yeah and mm. to walk away and have my world uh, my my view of a uh, how to read yeah mm. move mm. Uh, it, it unlocks yeah so yeah. Much. yeah and 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 of course the other thing is the, the the other journal which I'm still publishing which I'm still editing. Writers in Conversation, mm. and that and that, to me, um, that was also a sort of accidental thing. I, think, I don't know if you had time to read my little thing about the journals that I sent. Um, you know, it was really a friend said, oh, I'm really having trouble getting these interviews that I've done with writers published, and I said, well, let's start a journal then. <laughs> Surprising! How? Why? Why? What? What was the? Oh, oh, I don't know. The, <laughs> you know, who knows? There, are, there are people. There are people in academia who think that that, it, that interviews are not uh, just ephemera and they're not really serious. Um, uh, so you, you, you shouldn't you shouldn't um, base anything on them. You but I mean, I've always found them fascinating. You don't take them at face value, of course, but often they're the best way to, to, to get to know a writer. You know, you're not going to be able to meet all the writers you, you study personally, but if you read enough conversations with that writer, then you, um, uh, then you start, uh, you know, understanding where they're coming from. And, um, and you know, actually, one of my most successful publications, perhaps, is 
is a book of con- conversations with Iris Murdoch. So I collected f- f- over sort of 30 years' worth of conversations, about 20 different interviews with her and published them as a book. And then, then that was in, in 15, 16 years ago now. And that's become, you know, my, my major contribution to, the, to Iris Murdoch studies. Um, so, you know, so I've, and so I've always believed in, in the, in the, the, the that's a very interesting. I mean, imagine an inter- in interview with Jane Austen. Can you imagine how wonderful that would be? <laughs> to have available, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, and so, you know, the idea of, of having a, a place where people can bring interviews with writers and, you know, there are certain sort of stipulations. I have to be writers who've published, you know, a book or two. <laughs> um, they have to, you know, and they have to... I, I want interviews of a certain length, so I want them to be less than 2,000 words, so they're not just sort of sound bite type things. They're in-depth interviews. They need to be based on some research so that, the interviewer has to have, you know, to, to have done some, some groundwork and to be asking questions which are actually relevant to that person, not just a questionnaire if that it goes to everybody. Um, so there are those sort of things. And, and they, they, they also the interviewer has to write a, 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 an introduction so that we know who this person is. And I always think it's very important to, to say when and where the interview happened Right. Um, was it by email? Was it face to face? Was it by phone? Um, I hadn't to that aspect. Mm, so, mm. so where where is it, it? Just places it in chronology. Yeah, and yes. then it has was a cultural. Yes, because a face to face interview that's been transcribed is quite a different thing from a, an email. You know, it's quite a lot, quite often, and it's it's understandable. People will sort of just send an email email someone a list of questions and the person will answer them. And they can, that can be very valuable, but it's still not the same as this kind of backwards and forwards because the conversation doesn't isn't developing. It's just, And you quite often you get um, somebody saying, yes, uh, as I, uh, I've just answered that question in my, <laughs> my last answer. And it, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the wonderful things that happen are when, when the interviewer asks a question and the interviewee just, just you know, there, there, was, there was one of them, um, an interview with a, um, a transgender writer in one of the Indian languages. So this was translated into <laughs> English. From the original, it was conducted in the other language. I can't remember which language. Um, and the the interviewer said, uh, "You know, that as the as the discussion developed, the interviewer said, well, 'Well, I've been writing a novel.'" And the, the, the interviewee said, "Well, what's a novel?" <laughs> so, you know, you, you you create, you make people up and. And she said, "What? Well, I've never heard of that. I didn't know you could do that." Because she'd always written biography, you know, real life memoir type, and, and written people's stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And and it was that just that little wow, just insight into another world where the the fiction and the novel just isn't a thing. It's just I I, I found that absolutely fascinating. And, and an, another thing was when I was interviewing a novelist, an Australian novelist, and, um, and I'm quite interested in in what I call um, ethical, ethical, the, the sort of ethical questions that that, that writers face. So. Whenever you write something, whenever it's particularly perhaps particularly when you're writing fiction, but I think it probably it's probably 
whenever you're writing um, any kind of narrative particularly, you have to make decisions about whose point of view you're going to write from. Are you going to write in the first person? Are you going to pretend to be them and write? Or are you going to write third person and be, you know, be trying to be objective or look objective, seem objective? Um, do you write about minorities to which you don't belong? Can you, you know, how do you write about minorities to which you don't belong? Do you, do you try and pretend that, you know, can you impersonate them? If you don't impersonate them, can you write about them as if they're impenetrable others? You know, all these sort of questions. So that these are, these are the sort of things I, I find quite interesting and in how, how different writers have, have approached them. That's what my PhD was about. But I asked one of these authors, uh, this author I was um, interviewing, I said, how, and how do you approach the sort of ethical questions? And she said, well, oh, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, well, you know, was, was it an ethical decision to do such and such? And she said, no, goodness, goodness no. No, 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 it's just what works in the novel, you know. <laughs> so it was just that, whew, completely rushing away, you know, years and years of, of thought and work on my part. And I thought, well, that's so refreshing because, um, you know, many, many writers would say, oh, of course, you know, I'm very conscious. But, and, and, but then, of course, she came back at, afterwards and said, look, writing is a deeply moral act. I realise that. But it's got to work as a narrative, as a fiction. You can't just impose... Um, you know your political views or your whatever. You, you know it has to develop in a in a sort of organic way, and I and I think you know opinions vary, but I think a lot of writers would 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 agree with that. Would say that that's that is true, and and sometimes um, it means that you end up with things that that politically you you might not agree with you know you but you get, it takes you somewhere right the writing process will take you somewhere that you didn't expect to where you didn't expect to end up yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your character yeah. has, has pulled you yeah into the world, yeah that's right and and beautiful. and to me that is that is an enrichment um I suppose as long as you know what it is, you know, as long as you don't start thinking, well, that, that's therefore the truth. But, you know, if, if you... Uh, it, it expands your world, but you still, you still need to be criti think critically about it, of course. You know? So do you find that if, if you write? Do you, I do, I do, do write. You? Yeah. It was... From, when I had very little else... I would write. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, a, yeah. a viral pen. And yeah, the that's all you need, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, when mm. my surrounds were not, you know, not pleasant, mm. I could transport myself yeah. uh, by th thinking about places that are are different, I guess, yeah. and. I, I I think that for writing, the process of writing for mm. me mm. is a process of discovery. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I will sometimes start out writing. Right, okay. Here's an issue. I don't know what I think about mm. this issue. Yeah, yeah. And by the process of setting out to write about it. Yes. I have to ask myself all, yes. all of these questions. Yes, yes. And I also have to ask what is important about how I feel about this, you know, or, yep. or have discovered. Yes. And how communicable is that? Mm -hmm. where, where do other people yeah. see, come, come mm -hmm. into that? Uh, angle of inception yes. where they can see and maybe it's a nuance mm -hmm. um, 
Um, so, so yes, it, it's it's such, it's a powerful thing because yes. it's transformative. Yes. And it's not always, I, I can't control how it transforms yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm rather troubled when people say I'm writing in order to further the feminist cause or to, you know, to, to, to do one or more. Because I, I think it's, it is a transformative process and and you, and you writing can change lives and but. It's it's an un, it's an unpredictable thing, and it's it's it's, it's power is, you, and and you you might set out to be saying you know to to be trying to do one thing, and it might have all sorts of other effects. I mean, Doris Lessing is a wonderful case in point. I think um, <laughs> um, she was one of the writers I. I discussed in my PhD thesis and uh, yeah she wrote the golden notebook I don't know if you've read it I have yeah, but I... it's 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 a fascinating book it's in 1962 and, and it's and it's often thought of as the sort of the feminist manifesto for the, for the 60s she mm-hmm. didn't she that's not what she thought <laughs> <laughs> um, and she kept arguing with people about it and she kept, you know, it's the second edition, she wrote a preface saying, this is what I meant. <laughs> and then, you know, 10 years later, she gave an interview saying, look, look, you people, this is what I meant when I wrote The Golden Note. I didn't mean these things, I meant these things. And, um, and then it wasn't until about, you know, 30 years later, she finally came out and said, well, look, okay, now I'm, I'm kind of, I realise that people will read things differently. Different readers will read things differently, um, and um, um, that's all right. But you know, that was thirty years later when she was in her seventies, and she finally came to that came to that um, sort of accommodation with with her readers, and so um, so I, you know, that's just. Yeah, you know, that to me is just the the, the the sort of classic illustration of that. Yes, so sometimes writing can become, or people's work can become adopted. Yeah. Mm. By perspective. Yes. And yeah. I mean, I, I've noted this a few times yes. with certain authors. Uh, yes, George Orwell. George Orwell. Yes. Uh, um, mm. uh, I I love his description of poverty. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, and it, yeah. it's like he says, it's not shocking. Mm. It's, it's just banal. It's, yeah. it's mm. never ending. Yeah. Bland and, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Robert Tressel, uh, mm-hmm. the the ragged trousered philanthropist. Oh right, yes, okay. Yeah. Well, I was interested. Uh, finally, I picked it up eventually after being told so many times, you've got to do this, you know, you're doing dragon stuff. Yeah. Uh, well. uh, I read, uh, I read uh, his, his preface. Mm. He was saying, look, this is not a political manifesto or a treatise. Mm. Mm. This is... Yeah, and it, it speaks about what it is. It's, mm. a, it's a, a social biography, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, yeah. it's it's got you know so many different themes in, but mm. yet it has become this political mm. manifesto, mm. Mm. And, yep. mm. uh, and it can be these two things mm. at once. Mm. But for some people. That's not the case, mm. um, and of course the word, the way that words are used, mm. change over time. Mm. Sometimes, mm. Uh, yeah. So it, yeah. it is a it's a really interesting aspect. I, I, I tr- it leads me back to the political and mm. trying to separate off mm. the mm. political. Mm. You know, here's the pre-political mm-hmm. mm. and the. Political mm. is a different arena, mm. Mm. and I, I've mm. been told, well, everything's political. Yeah, well, of course, every you know that's what Orwell said. I think he said, you know, "All writing is political." Mm. 
um, everything is political, but I mean, in, in a way, that's a meaningless statement, isn't it? It's like, well, you all, know, all ratings historical. Yeah, or you know, everything is. If everything is, if everything is political, then <laughs> then you know, nothing is political, sort of thing. You know, just it's just. Um, so, but some obviously some things are more political than others. So, <laughs> yeah, um, there's I suppose overtly political and covertly political, and and um, I, I uh, guess if I'm mm, assembling mm, a, a group of people to think in a certain way, mm, mm. that's how I've come to view political with a big yeah, 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 and I'm I'm actually in a, a discovery process. <laughs> What yes. the heck is this world yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Um, which, which, which doesn't uh, make itself amenable to simple no. No. renderings. No, no, uh, so, no. So I try and hold these different versions in mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look up uh, the golden note with mm. great mm. relish. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know she, she wrote so in such complex ways mm, mm. That, that challenge simple notions about people's exactly, lives. Exactly, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, that, and that's probably, I mean, that's like, that's her, probably her most famous book, I, would, I, I reckon. Um, it might be her best book, I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, there are a lot, there's, a huge variety, you know. She was just uh, she was well, she was a, a, a working writer, so she wrote pop boilers, which and the pop boilers I think were really good, <laughs> um, because sometimes she allowed herself in those cases. She sort of allowed herself just to be to relax and be funny, and she really had quite a good sense of humour. But you know, when she was being stern and critical and you know, making a point, it was. Just sometimes got a little bit, um, you know, intense. But <laughs> but you know, others will disagree. Um, but yes, I, you know, I think that that's that's a, that's a really good point. And it just it just it's just so narrowing to s just see one. And uh, I mean, I I I'm a feminist. Yeah, you know, I, I just think everyone, everyone should be a feminist. I mean, even that's a probably a contentious statement, but I just assume that m women and men are equal and have equal capacities and, and rights and that sort of thing. Um, there's, but lately, especially with the Me Too movement, it, it, that really troubles me, actually, because I think there's a, there's just a, a sort of automatic assumption now that, that women are, are in the right and men are in the wrong. And I, don't, I mean, that can't be right, you know. Like all, I can't see that it's a feminist point to say no woman ever does anything wrong. Yes. After we spoke to you, after we were talking to you on Friday, Friday, Thursday, what yeah. day was it? Saturday. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> Saturday, wasn't it? Um, yeah. While Bashabi and I were waiting for the bus, there was a, a couple in the street arguing, and, and he was yelling and yelling and yelling, and she was sort of pleading with him. And, and he was so angry, and she was upset, and she was trying to. And, you know, the immediate assumption is he's bullying her, she's. Uh, you know, she's just being nice and he's bullying her about something. But how can we know that? You know, we, these people will have a history, years perhaps. Who knows what's happened? I mean, I, I would not want to say she's being bullied by, you know, the, he's got a louder voice. <laughs> uh, he's swearing, you know, and it do, does, does look like it. You know, very difficult situation, uh, and you do sort of wonder, well, why is she not just walking away? Because he's telling her to, and he's never saying, you know. and <laughs> um, 
Well, who knows? Who knows what's what's really going on there? So I don't want to just say, oh, that poor victimised woman and that terrible, you know, um, bullying man. I, I want to know. I want to. I want to know more before I judge them. That's 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 all. I mean, you know, if if that happens, to, if that is the case, I mean, you know, then that's that's something. But uh, the, these are interesting ambiguities. Mm, I, mm. I was on a a, a train uh, and. I, uh, I was with my partner mm. and uh, we, we saw some, uh, somebody and uh, this this woman was uh, merry on drink mm. <laughs> and she was being lively with everybody in the carriage mm. but in particular she she sort of was physically sort of touching man, mm. you know, his hair and mm. stuff, and going, oh, come on, you know, I'm mm. just... Ta-. Mm. And, and everybody who carry sort of mm. was going, okay, you know, here's a, somebody who's drunk, mm. who's somebody who's making mm. you know, mischief, and mm. uh, this this guy was being really uncomfortable. Yeah. But after mm. my partner said to me, she said, mm, if a guy had been doing that to a woman... Mm there would be a very different reaction mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in the carriage. And yeah. I re- realised I sort of could look for a moment at my own paralysis in that. Mm. And I, you don't know. Mm. Yes. The, yeah. the, with, with all the layering yeah. of, of... Yes, yeah. And it, it can... Yeah, sometimes I worry that... that, that, that Maybe I'm overthinking, and, and maybe I should have just intervened, you know. Maybe, but I, I, I just feel a really deep reluctance to inter- interfere where I don't know, where I don't know enough. And but of course, you know, sometimes you you need to. You, you might just need to see something. You might need to <clears throat> just take some some kind of direct action. And almost, yeah, yeah, almost, yeah. 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 Um, without knowing the full facts, and then maybe later on you sort out the full facts. But, um, yeah, it is, it is, it is a trouble. I mean, uh, VS Naipaul has this, this um, he was talking in one of his interviews, once again, interviews, he's talking about the difference between the long visioned, and of course, he's deeply sexist, so he's a Long visioned man, the medium visioned man, and the short visioned man. So the long vision, he, he, he was saying, you know, he he himself was a long visioned man. So it it kind of paralyzes you in a way because you're looking. You always want the longer picture, the broader picture, the bigger picture. And whereas the short visioned man is just wondering what how he's going to get his dinner. Um, the medium visioned man is probably the man of who can act and have some foresight and, and you know, without worrying too much about that. So, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very reductive way of looking at the world. But it, 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 to me it's, it's an interesting kind of, um, just a little interesting template that you might way of thinking. And, and, I, and I suppose if I'm any of those, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm not a man anyway. <laughs> But uh, perhaps I'm the medium vision one, but, but I, I like to also take take the bigger picture. But I won't just jump in and take, yeah. I'll stand back and try and assess and maybe spend too long trying to assess before I do anything. I think that, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah you, mm-hmm. you, one has to try and work off mm-hmm. what, what actually is mm-hmm. rather than... The immediate appearances. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and but when you do come across something that's that invo- results in any harm. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's mm. every reason to mm. intervene because yeah. mm. uh, though you know, mm. a healthy world is one without harm. Yeah, indeed. So, yeah. But if a, if a if a mother is speaking, you know, sharply to their child, and you think that's unnecessary. I mean, I would, I, 
I wouldn't sort of, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and say, so, you know, be nice to your child. <laughs> you just imagine that sort of a reaction you get. <laughs> and probably rightly too, in a way, because you don't know how, how much, how, because you've got to think about the woman. She's been trying to deal with this child all day and, you know, yeah. <laughs> you might have been misbehaving and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Pete, uh, we, when we're working with um, absolutes, mm. you know, mm. you know mm. categoricals, yeah. mm. we will, we'll be setting up ourselves for categorical problems. Yeah. And mm. that has stayed with me so yeah. fundamentally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wait a minute. Okay, I, I I may know how I feel about this in the abstract. Yes. But in in context. Yes. Yes. What? Yeah. The, the context mixes up all the categories. Yes. And they're tied to yeah. each other, yeah. and understanding how things are interrelated yeah. in that small culture. Yeah. Is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, th I, th I think that's that was part of my hubris of youth, mm. assuming that I knew. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very common youthful hubris, <laughs> isn't it? I remember, you know, Robert Louis Stevenson said of, of you know, that he lived in Samoa for a while um, and to other Pacific Islands. And he said, look, the thing is, if you, we come in to these societies and we think, oh, that's in, that's an invidious law. We should change that. We should, you know. But if you change one, one thing, in a society, in a society, the long-established society, you can't just come in and, and change one thing. It's, you know, that that could be the destruction of the whole culture, good and bad. You know, so. Um, I mean, you know, you think, well, obviously, you know, child sacrifice or, 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 or bride burning or, you know, and all those things are just horrible. And you think, yes, just no, we must get rid of those. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, um I, I'm very interested in international uh, um, uh, aid and uh, mm, in yeah, the, the problems that, that, that <coughs> they're having to look at. Mm. Right. Well, we've gone over and we said, mm. right, we can help you. And mm. this, if you do everything that yeah, we do, yeah, yeah. everything will be okay. Yes. And then these situations get go mm. from bad to worse. Mm. Mm. Um, and the, the hard questions <coughs> that aid agencies have had to ask, mm. uh, uh, um, particularly in light of undermining economies and mm. how people yeah. related to each other yeah. in those economies, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's it um, it makes me think of sustainability, mm. which. which I think it are good reflections on mm. on pithy problems that happen in other areas. We've not mm. had the develop the language yet to mm. articulate well. Mm. Um, the the was it the cane toad in Australia? The, the cane toad, yes. To, that yeah. was introduced, yes. right? Okay, so yes. here's yes. an eco ecology. Yeah. And we don't like this, so we'll yeah. introduce yeah. this. Yes. To yeah. eat this, yes, and the result is that there are the, just yes. <laughs> the, was it yeah. the, the the flies that they were introduced mm. to eat that mm. just started existing mm. out with their reach in the cane toads pro uh, proliferated, prol proliferated yeah. abnormally yes. and started eating other yes. things. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The cane toad. It, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real um, cautionary tale, the cane toad, <laughs> um, and 
I mean, other biological controls have been introduced and have been more successful and, and you know, and less disastrous. <clears throat> and because I think, you know, as people know better and better now and, and can actually, uh, are more careful about what they do. But, yeah, uh, because, of course, what you're doing is introducing uh, is bringing another introduced species to deal with a, a, a species that was introduced earlier. So we, we've already buggered up the, the ecology of Australia, <laughs> you know, 250 years ago or whatever. Um, and so now we're just sort of running along behind trying to, trying to fix all the, the mistakes that were made. Uh, the rabbits, you know, rabbits are, are a real pest in Australia, and a lot of feral animals are a real pest. And they were just brought on ships without with people not really thinking about the consequences. Um, and then, uh, uh, but then, what do you do? You know, so that uh, you know, to, to, there are a whole. This is the, the CSIRO, which is our um, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. Um, you know that would be one of their major um, preoccupations. How how do we deal with uh, these introduced species, the invasive species, not just plant animal animals but plants as well. Um, and and you know as you say there there is an analogy with uh, with cultures as well. Um, I mean they're they're in a way you can sort of call them ecologies, the human cultures, human societies. It's comfortable for me because it's a concept that that allows for complexity. Yes. Uh, yes. And um, mm. I I I. One one thing that I've been writing about recently is if if we allow ourselves a third person view mm -hmm. and look mm -hmm. at Homo sapiens mm -hmm. and their habitat, yes, uh, and their habitat being composed of the environmental mm -hmm. and the sociological, mm -hmm. you know, that yes, we can start to ask, hey. We can start to understand differences that have occurred. Yeah. And if we go back 100 years, 500, mm. we can start to understand we're, we're losing our habitat. Mm. We're actually undermining our own, mm. what, what helps us relate and function in the world. Yeah. yeah. We're damaging. So, mm. um, yeah, mm. I, I find culture... Uh, and habitat and mm -hmm. ecology, the, mm -hmm. these concepts, mm -hmm. very mature yes, ones. Yes. Um, yeah. It's. Uh, it, I was looking at UNESCO's uh, website and they're mm -hmm. starting to talk about intangible cultural assets. Mm -hmm. Only just starting. <laughs> 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 really, was, I've been trying to find more yeah. on their website, yeah. but I, I mean, mm. it's such a labyrinth of, mm. uh, of an organisation. Yeah, yeah. But these, yeah, I, I, I think people are missing them mm. uh, and understanding mm. that we're interrelated mm. with everybody mm. and everything. Yes. Is, is such an important place to start navigating that complexity. Yes. We, standing from the outside and starting with assumptions, assertions, mm. you know, mm. Uh, mm. categorical concepts, mm. we'll never meet with the reality. Yeah. We'll all, only be able to, uh, all right, we've got a swatch with red, blue, and green. Mm. <laughs> We're walking through yeah. that sort of reddish. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. You know, that's, Really? <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. sort of blue. That's yeah. that. That's not on our swatch. Yeah. So we'll just, we'll just ignore it. it. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's, that's exactly the sort of thing that happened when the Europeans came to Australia. You know, they saw 
you know, the, they saw a, 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 a landscape which was radically different to the European landscape. And so they kind of um, just fitted it in with with their ideas of, uh, of um, you know, the way what they were used to and the farming methods they were used to and, and with, you know, quite sad consequences, really. Um, I am aware that uh, the, the, cult, the European ideas mm. uh, and mm. landed mm. Were, were prominent, well, uh, uh, Aboriginal peoples were mm. categorised as uh, flora and fauna until the 1970s. I was... Yes. It, it sort of yeah. helps me understand. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's... Yeah, and well, it was 1967, Australia had a referendum which recognised um, recognised Aboriginal people as part of the population, so it allowed them, I mean, it was it was a sort of technicality, really, it allowed them to be counted in the census, it allowed them to be um, the, the federal government to make laws about about them, I think that's right. Um, so, you know, that sounds little enough, uh, but it um, that you know they didn't really have have a say or a vote or anything. They were just regarded as some, something that was there and in, in many ways an inconvenience. Um, and you know, it's really taken until now for them, well, until maybe the seventies, for them to be start being empowered at all. But there's still a huge way to go. Um, they're still not recognised. It's not, still not recognised in the constitution that Australia was inhabited before we came. The Europeans came. There are now uh, there's now a lot of common law which recognises that, which gives them various rights, land rights, um, and cultural rights. Um, but uh, but it's, you know, this, the, the, the kind of social deprivation among, among a lot of them is just shocking. The, the, there are echoes for me in how women very much were so have, have also experienced that structural mm. yeah. Uh, disappearing. Yeah, that's right. Of course, you know, not even having the vote or you know, South Australia was the second place to give women the vote after New Zealand. I know. Yeah. So we're pretty proud of that. But uh, you right. know, the, the, the thing is that. You know, you can say, but and then has the has the progress been constant ever since? And we got better and better. Well, you know. <laughs> not necessarily, <laughs> um, because there's not equal representation of women in parliament by any means. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, mm, anyway, <laughs> what else have we got? So, well. Uh, I'd like to uh, hear your thoughts on, on how useful metrics oh. are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, I, I, I realised there were a certain number of metrics in what I sent you about that because that was obviously it's an easy way to say, look, we've breached. 22 million readers or, or whatever, you know, and, and that impress, that, that immediately impresses somebody. But you have to know, anyone with a brain has to know that that's just part of the story. I mean, what does it mean that 20 million or 2 million people or 2 million articles have been downloaded? Um, does it mean they were read? Does it mean that they had any the influence on anybody as a you know what? it's it's just the beginning of the story really isn't it it's 
and and you know these days these days it's becoming more and more to be regarded as the end of the story. Um, so that, that's yeah. How do the paperwork and bureaucracies uh, that you've had to engage with to get mm. uh, funding and support? Mm. Aided you in achieving your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm I'm very lazy, and I don't. Well, <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe lazy is not the word, but I, I prefer to spend my time doing doing concrete things rather than. Uh, so I ha- I and because I was I, actually I was fortunate for ten years to work in a reasonably supportive environment that would, that if I put in my, you know, if, if I did the work on my journal, then the, the university would allow me to host it on their web server and the, li- the library, my colleagues in the library were always very, very helpful. So I had help in kind, um, but I never had any funding. Right. So, so you have to. <laughs> no, so I, you know, I, I would rather do it myself than try and write grant applications and try. And, um, and you know, I, I know that you know, people always say, "Well, why don't you ask, you know, such and such an Australian council or whatever? Why don't you apply?" And you look at the, what you have to do, and I think, oh, really? You know, I could, I could edit five articles while, while, while I'm. Um, doing that work um so something something that's really bugbear for me in academia is now that you that grants that getting these competitive grants from the australian research council and from other organizations becomes a measure of your value so so to me that's an that's an input not an output if you receive some money then what do you do with it? It's, it's not in itself. I mean, it's a sort of success, congratulations, that's great, but it's the beginning of your project and then you have to go out and, and make it worthwhile and spend the money properly and, and, and you know. So if you're going to be measured on something, you should be measured on what you do with the grant, not just the fact that you've got the grant, but, but that's, you know, one of the sort of, criteria for, for for being a successful academic now is to get such and such an amount of grant money um, as well as, you know, publishing in the right sort of places which are not the sort of places where the community will find your work really. Usually, it's usually just talking to academic, other academics. Um, uh, and 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 really, that's kind of it, you know. So, so, so research, you know, I remember saying to the deputy vice chancellor of research, I said, "Look, as a humanities scholar, you know, I don't need a hadron collider or a you know <laughs> medical imaging machine that's worth millions of dollars. I just need time and a good library, which is." A public, you know, it's not something just for me. I, I want the library to be well funded. I don't, you know, um, and I need some. T- I need. I need time to think, to write, to to read. And uh, his response was, "Well, surely you could find something to apply for." <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> Uh, so uh, I just find it disheartening, and, and, I, and I'm lucky because I haven't I haven't been an academic, a, a career academic. Yeah. So I've been outside that system. Yeah. Um, but you know, my colleagues who are in the system and who have to have to sort of keep doing this, and they have to spend the whole of January, the whole of their the summer holidays, or you know, after after Christmas until they come back in, uh, rather than preparing for courses or. F- writing their own, you know, doing their own research, they actually have to spend 
the whole of January writing grant applications in order to go for these grants where you get, it's a 20, 10 20% success rate. So they're competing with all their peers mm-hmm. for this pot of money, which they don't really need and doesn't really seem to me to prove anything. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying that grants are never good, but and, and it, obviously it can be great if you're doing a big collaborative sort of project. But if you're, if you're, if you're just working away on your own in, in that sort of standard humanities model, if you're a philosopher or a um, literary scholar, you know, what do you need? With it? You don't need $100,000. Then you have to think, oh, what am I going to spend it on? I know you have to justify it, but you know, then you have to administer the money and you've got all that, all that extra stuff. But it, you know, for me, it was much easier just to publish the journal, do the work, um, um, and, but of course, sustainability was always the problem. What was going to happen when I decided, I knew I was, didn't want to do it forever. And what was going to happen when I decided not to? And there were so many discussions about that. And nobody, I don't think anyone really took it seriously until I finally said that this coming issue is going to be my last. That's it. You know, take me seriously this time. Mm-hmm. And that meant that there was an issue a year ago. That was my last issue. And then they sort of scrambled around and managed to get an issue out in December. Now then that won't be another one until July next year. So after being regularly six monthly for ten years, it's just um, mm. <laughs> uh, well it's like thank you very much. Oh thank you. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I I I enjoy having these these relaxed conversations mm. with people. Mm. Because this is, uh, well, it's a, it's, it's a world, it's a way of seeing the mm. world in fresh ways for me. Mm. So. Good, uh, good, and, and vice versa, you know. And, and, you know, congratulations on your work too. Oh. It's, just, yeah, it's fabulous what you're doing. Well, it's mm. very much inspired by inspired people like you. <laughs>